All right, let's start with this, okay? So, Arti, thank you so much for joining in. And uh, for our viewers, I'm really quickly going to go over our bio. And after that, we get into a bunch of questions. So, Arti Bhagdi has won the Filmfare, nine international film festival awards, which include the Grand Prix at the largest children film festival of Japan, second best international film, and the best actress by H.A.K. IS Ministry of Culture of Turkey, um, India, US, and Vietnam. She's also won an award from the government of India's NIRDPR for her films in the last couple of years. They have been Kamaka, Ornedo, and Free, Fair, and Fearless, respectively. Feature length films, the anthology Shuruat Ka Interval with PBR Select, with PBR Select, sorry, as director. Bomberia, this is the one I always grew up. Bomberia, is it? How do you how do you say that? Bomberia. Bomberia, featuring Radhika Apte as a co-writer and associate producer, streams on Netflix. So that's something that you know all of us can have immediate access to. She also co-directed a feature-length documentary on the sky-clad monks called Vidyodaya. Vidyodaya. Vidyodaya which found about 300 plus screenings across the world which is like incredible like 300 screens that's i mean yeah amazing. that was uh, yeah it was organized by their community the jain the number community all over the uh, hmm. okay and um, she began her career with rashi production and mukta arts limited and has been has about 18 years plus of experience in the in the, in the indian and the working stint with the Japanese film industry. Recently in the COVID world, uh, produced and hosted a series of women in business of filmmaking for a digital network and directed a film titled Prada with actors and crew within Parda. her neighborhood. Parda. Now this this has been, uh, you, you kind of roped in the people from your neighborhood. You didn't, okay, so. Yeah, yeah, so live. my DOP is my neighbor and friend. Two of the actors, we like we we're not friends, friends. We just got to know them. They were also free in lockdown. We also in free in lockdown. So you know, you come together. So mm -hmm. yeah, it was uh, quite a experience. So making the most of people around you. Yeah. That's cool. The COVID actually, world made to know the ones who are close to you physically. Actually, getting <laughs> to know that has been the thing. You don't even know who's around you. <laughs> well, yeah, in Bombay, you don't even know who your neighbor is. So I, yeah. I kind of agree to that. <laughs> so I mean, the I'm COVID world has made the COVID world has made Arthi, Arthi pick up her pencil and discover the sketch artist hidden in her. She took the hundred days hundred sketch challenge, which led to being featured in India Today magazine. And about thirty five of her artworks have found uh, have found takers, and now she keeps some time aside every day for her artwork. So that's impressive. You know, during COVID times, you find out that you have a artist hidden inside. Yeah, <laughs> I'm so thrilled that I discovered it at this age. When you when you need to discover, you discover, I guess. I would love to discover something like this at the age of 50 years. <laughs> you know, Tagore this started painting at the age of 60. Like after, so I, I saw this in a play on Rabindranath Tagore that mm -hmm. he uh, he fell in love with this Austrian woman who couldn't read any of his writings. Mm -hmm. And he was so disheartened that she can't get the, you know, she can't get him if she can't read the writing. So she started painting for him. He started painting for her just to communicate with her. OK. Yeah. Okay. That's quite so let's get down to the questions. And you know this is going to be all over the place so there's i mean i really don't know i just read through the bio and everything poured out and i just wrote down everything so tell me something how does it feel to be on a live show that's streaming on multiple platforms at the same time uh i'm okay with it actually because i've been i've been in your seat so uh <laughs> <laughs> so i've conducted these live shows yeah and actually i've done a few sessions uh with an Annapurna Film School and with IIT and WW screenings and so it's 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 easy for me so it's okay I'm okay. at I think I'm okay let's see how your questions go <laughs> <laughs> okay so right now you know there's nothing in your control the lighting the sound maybe at subpar the framing is you know limited to whatever you've put in front of yourself 
and we are really at the mercy of the bandwidth gods. For someone used to calling the shots behind the camera all the time, you know, sitting in front of the camera and, you know, like, you think you're going to be in your elements and just start ignoring it after a few minutes or is it still going to play at the back of your mind? God, the framing is not good. God, the lighting is horrible. No, I ignore it. I'm not too conscious of the camera at all, actually. So okay. for me, it's just part and parcel of like, because that's the way. Otherwise, how do you direct people? Right. How do you mm -hmm. you you can't be conscious then you, there's inhibition. You have to be uninhibited when you want to create the best out of things around you. So, yeah, it's best to not be conscious and just treat it as a part of your surroundings. Fair enough. So yeah. when does your family um, move from Nagpur to Chennai? Actually, my uh, my maternal side was uh, Nagpur. I was born in Nagpur, but I okay. was raised in Chennai. Yeah, so okay, paternal so side was fully in Chennai. You've so always been around. in Chennai. You're just born in Nagpur. Born in, yeah, okay. and every summer holiday was Nagpur and Bombay like that. So uh, yeah, and um, then um, yeah, so Chennai was home ground for nearly twenty years up to my graduation, and. Mm -hmm. um, uh, after that, I moved to Pune. I did my post-graduation in uh, Symbiosis Institute of Mass Communication, which was an advanced diploma of all sorts. So I thought I'll yeah, be doing general. All that, all that's coming up. I've got it yeah. all covered. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, how good were you, or how how were you as a student during your time at Good Shepherd Convent? Were you like one of the backbenchers, like I always was, or how how did you? I was average, Fair I school. think. There were some good years and then there were not some, there were some average years. Sorry. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah. So, um, I think junior school was excellent for me. I did very well during junior school. Then I had a few weak years in the middle where I was, so uh, I think uh, I could be, could have been better. I mm -hmm. was bright, but I think I was not capitalizing myself too well enough okay. during those years. And uh, yeah, and then um, I think again, I emerged better in college. Mm -hmm. uh, I think first year college onwards, I became better as a student and even generally as a performer. So I think from seventh to 12th was a very above average kind of a situation, like 75 plus, 80 plus, not like 90s and all that. So 75, number, 80, that, I mean, even if I put the aggregate of my three terms, I wouldn't score 80. <laughs> no, but you know, you're not a talker. So yeah, it's just that. It's just then doing mediocre stuff. <laughs> okay. So should I assume that like every good Marwari, the bachelor in business administration, administration was a predetermined choice? No, no, no. So I did, I took up science in 11th and 12th. I had like this determination to go on on my father's path because father had, was a fantastic engineer had done ac tech and then ift and all that so mm -hmm. i thought that i had his genes and i should like you know continue doing the chosen thing of being an engineer and then i realized i just don't have the brains for science and that was a bad decision 11th and 12th was a very bad decision i would have easily taken like history or english or something like that instead of science but i don't know what made me take science up and uh, I think I floundered quite a bit in those two years like I was not uh, I had to really work hard like you know it was not easy it was not natural for me to be good at science I figured then I decided no I cannot take five years of engineering and studying physics and chemistry <laughs> again and again <laughs> like, no, this is not me and math and I was like let me just jump into something else so I the first there was a new course that opened up that time in Chennai. It was called Business of uh, Bachelor of Business Administration. It was a very new graduation course that was not available all over India. It was just, I think, in two or three universities. So I just jumped at it. I said, Chalo, it's been, I mean, it was time to care. People were allowing you to flip from science to commerce. They were, you know, not so strict about certain things. So right. I easily yeah, got that seat and then I just went in. And they, of course, that I did. I was very happy I did that because that's <laughs> So, yeah. so then you finish up your BBA and then you head on for your post graduation for which you chose Symbiosis. Any particular reason why you pick Symbiosis over the other colleges that were available for your diploma in MassCom? So no, again during that time you had those two traditional choices of doing an MBA as well right. as uh, yeah. So I was 
I, I mean, of course, I also studied CAT and all gave so many entrance exams and this and that. And then um, there were a couple of universities in MBA that I got through. One mm -hmm. was uh, in Chennai only in my in the college that I was studying. I topped that entrance exam. But then and then I I think uh, but I still chose to do. There was MassCom also available in the Chennai college, and I still chose to do the MassCom. I took up. I attended two weeks class. And then I got this call from Symbiosis that you've been selected. You've topped in the writing, print journalism, wala section. So we'll take mm -hmm. you as a print student. So my mother was confused. She didn't want me to go to Pune. Then uh, and we'd already <laughs> paid up for fees in uh, Chennai. In so Chennai. then uh, we went. She, I said, at least come and meet my principal here in Chennai. And my right. principal encouraged my mother. Said, no, no, what exposure she'll get in Pune? She won't get here in Chennai. Send her to send, <laughs> send her to Pune. <laughs> And then that and another sister of mine, Nalini, she convinced my mother that no, you should send her. Pune is another level of education. So right. then, and my and I was most attracted because one of my my mama ji's family was there, and three of my cousins whom I'm really close to. I wanted to live. I wanted to have that experience in my life of living with that family because I was very close to all five of them. So uh, that's one. So then you had you had you had family to help you around in Pune. It wasn't like yeah yeah. Know, I was living with family. I was not living with family. Okay. Yeah yeah yeah. All right. So all that started is, in Bombay. Okay. So there is there is uh, that story in your college days that you were on stage with Tom Alter. Tell us about it. Oh right, shit yeah. Oh that was funny. <laughs> it was great. Uh, so Tom Walter was uh, had come as one of the guest lecturers in our uh, college, and uh, uh, he had it was just fabulous to see me so involved and so intense and this and that. Then he uh, he just threw a question <laughs> open in the class. Two people can come and do one improv session with me. So mm -hmm. I just naturally put my hand up and he called me. And uh, so the improv session, he gave me a brief that you are my daughter. And I've come to tell you that I'm marrying again. We've just lost. You've just lost your mother. I've just lost my wife. And I'm going to come. I'm coming and telling you I'm getting married again. And how are you going to take it? Let's just mm -hmm. work on that thing. It was complete and, improv. That, that was doing yeah, on. completely improv. So I, uh, I realized I was dramatic. <laughs> so <laughs> I had the dramatic element in me. So I went all. It was like a class of 100. I was seniors, juniors, everyone combined. And uh, I think it went off decently well because I didn't realize again. I think I forgot. I was in the moment. I got absorbed as that girl who's lost her mother and her father's marrying again. And this and there was a glass of water kept on the table. I threw the glass of water. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone was amazed that she's just not bothered and she's doing her, you know, performing how it needs to be done. And I think the idea was he'd given me a little brief where he told me that. He wants me to be uh, suspicious, okay? But it went in such a way that I, it became more like I was the victim, and he was, and he was kind enough to take on the role of being the negative part, where he actually wanted me to be the negative uh, person in the relationship. So right. it was nice, and then it was, uh, it, it just turned around. The whole improv session went like completely opposite of what he had planned. So it was good to, uh, and he was just letting me. Take on the role the way I wanted to. So that was nice. And then yeah, it gave me a nice note also after that. <laughs> Fun. So now, um, you know, you grew up in a joint family in Chennai and uh, joint families back in those days, nowadays it's very hard to come across joint families, but back in those days, joint families were, usually have been completely an orchestrated chaos with the siblings. How many siblings uh, were you guys in the family? Like the whole so family. We were eight of us. Oh dear God. <laughs> Nine of us. Yeah, we had we were that many, and we had uh, three cows, and uh, yeah, yeah, so we and eight adults. It was a good big and staff of another six seven people. So it was a good big family living together of twenty five people under one roof, including mm -hmm. the staff and the house help and all that. So yeah, it was. Uh, so I had I was very close. Um, um, the a week apart is my sister Pooja, my okay. Chachi's daughter. So we two grew up together, same class. We were given the same clothes. <laughs> so I treated us. <laughs> so yeah, it was always. And Pooja was a bright child. She was like like she was the topper. She was she she didn't need to like uh, 
possibly read anything twice over. She would just read it once and it would stay in her head. And I had uh, to complete that all my life. Yeah, like... <laughs> so, yeah. I still mock her about it. <laughs> so uh, I would take it you were all plus minus a couple of years, uh, all of you. Yeah, all so my own brother is five years older to me. And uh, the eldest is Arno Didi. She's in Calcutta. So she's six years older to me. And there's another one, Kavita Didi, who's eight years older to me, I think. And she actually took care of me and Pooja. So we had a huge influence from her. I don't remember sleeping or getting hugged by my mother for the first seven, eight years of my life because I think we were all the time with Kavita Didi. She was this military woman in our life for both me and Pooja. <laughs> she would wake us up at five. We had to go for a run. We had to come back. We had to have three glasses of milk. We had to have palak. We had to do all those things that kids don't like to do. And if we don't do it, we would get like two slaps and we would be dumped inside the tank. <laughs> and then <laughs> anything against us. So yeah, yeah. So it was quite Crazy. a nightmare to live under her. But now we to take her case happily. So then you finished off your education from Pune and then uh, around that time through St. Voices, you had to have an internship. Now, was this internship mandatory or was it something you opted for? No, no. So everyone did an internship. There were three, uh, two internships <clears throat> that were mandatory and the third internship was hopefully supposed to convert to a job or whatever. Mm -hmm, yeah, mm -hmm. there were three internships actually. So the, for so me, the second intern internship. The first yeah. internship was, was, was with Indian Express. That was actually compulsory for the entire 100 to do one print internship. So everybody, and that time India had gone into elections. India was in elections mode. So we had to do a print in, internship during that time. So I did with New Indian Express uh, in okay. Chennai. And then I came to Bombay. And then my internship with Rajshree Productions actually led to a job. Okay. Yeah, so that's what I was going to ask you. You know, your internship with Rajshree Production. how long was it, the internship period? So it was two months, July, August, yeah. Okay. 2000 of July and August, yeah. Okay. But it was so, enough for me to realize that this is what I want to do. Okay. So was it a paid internship? Because, I mean... I didn't expect it to be a paid internship, but they were really kind and they said, no, no, you're coming, going. I used to mm -hmm. be using that time. I was in love with the Bombay uh, bus transport system. They were always best. on time. They were, yeah, best. <laughs> always clean and they were so lovely and I was in Bombay monsoon so it was just wonderful to be like using the buses during that time and I was always against the tra traffic that time I was living with my mamaji in uh, Charni road so okay. I had to come to Prabhadovi so then it was always uh, nice uh, it was always a good drive down and uh, so yeah those uh, so they were like no no you're paying to come go and little mm -hmm. so we should pay you so yeah it ended up being a pay I was one of the two or three interns who got paid in the internship yeah, okay, good. So that that's good. So now, for someone who was never exposed to the glitter and the glamour of the industry, how do you uh, go about coming to terms with this whole new universe in the first couple of days of your internship? I mean, you know, you could have probably been um, running into some celebrity or someone uh, whose name you had obviously heard from the industry. Like, was it like all shock and awe of like seeing? No, that? no. Not at all. In fact, because we were in the pre, -pro there was no film on floor at that time when I was doing an internship. I was more scripts were on and it was more pre-production. I'm very grateful that there was no film on floor. Otherwise, I would have just been like flowing away with the film. For me, it began with actually storytelling, falling in love with the craft of a story, what story to tell for films. So, you know, those kind of basic grounding stuff was happening rather than actually the glitz and glamour. If the shoot was on, I'm sure I would have gone with the flow with like, oh, it's so glamorous to be on a shoot and all that. But I think for me, I'm glad I'm fortunate that uh, that was the time that I w happened to be in the company that we actually, I actually understood filmmaking at a very uh, basic level. Uh, what okay. is scene writing? What is film writing? So those things actually made, when that was exposed to me, I actually fell in love with filmmaking. So that's how it uh, this is how a film is made. Otherwise, you actually, when you view a few film, you're viewing it for your favorite actors. Very rarely you will possibly have enjoyed a whole story as such at that age, especially. You know, you're just exposed to one particular kind of thinking. But with mm -hmm. that, it really opened up, and I'm glad it happened the way it did. I mean, I'm so grateful to Mr. Rajkumar Bajatya. He was like such a powerful influence in my life. I mean, yesterday's mm -hmm. teachers didn't know more. 
So I mean, I think I wrote the longest letter to him after finishing my internship. Like I had never met someone like him. I'd never ever like had the encounter of being this this role model that he was, the kindest human being, and uh, just made me feel like I was his daughter and just comfortable, and it was just too good. So I guess it 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 obviously means a lot uh, for you because you came into an industry with no hooks or no connections, and uh, you know, for lack of a better word, you're a complete outsider. So this was basically something that like you know galvanized everything for you. Okay. I mean, I couldn't so, have imagined a better start. Hmm. I'm sure I wouldn't have gotten into this field if it wasn't for Raj Productions. Okay. So after this internship with Rashi, you decide to you know get in this industry for the long haul. So what are the first couple of years like? You know, in the city with like I said, you know, no connections, no hooks, and you're trying to get a job in an industry which is so elusive and so, you know, like uh, I don't know if uh, you know, so closed doors. You know, it's like a private club of sorts. Yeah, very true. So. Uh... So luckily, like because my internship led led to like at the end of the internship, Ratsa was like, "Why do you need to go back finish your course? You just continue working with us." I said, "No, no, I should finish my course. I have one more year left." Finish it. I said, "Yeah, come to lunch. Yeah, I mean, but not here. So then, no, no, we will finish the course. So then, um, and uh, finished, and then I immediately uh, joined them as soon as my course got over, exams got over, April. I joined them in April. and uh, uh, worked with them for two years uh, immediately okay. got on to a film on a film set suraj sir's film was going on floor during that time so i joined them as an assistant director uh, there were three other batchmates who had also got placed in rashi production so they also joined on the on on set as assistant directors i was living mm-hmm. with two other smc batchmates both were mm-hmm. cnbc journalists shweta mm-hmm. and anu who i'm still very very close to and okay. uh, uh, so yeah it began it was interesting for the first two months i was staying with my mama ji and then of course i had to decide to move yeah. out because move out. Yeah. you can't be living with your uncle and coming and going as you please and you know how films are so i mm-hmm. uh, had to then luckily anu and shweta were like come you stay with us and then i moved in with them and uh, it was uh, first we lived in this one room in car and pg Uh, with this uh, Christian <laughs> auntie, she was quite something. A <laughs> pleasant pa- Felicity Park in Car. So yeah, then finally we moved out from six months. Uh, we were there, then we found this really big two be two bedroom hall kitchen in Bandra. I had like the most throwaway price possible. We were three <laughs> girls. We couldn't believe it. At first, when I when we walked into the house, I was like, Shweta, no, this is like a such a dump. She was just like, Arti, shut up. Just imagine the whole place clean. I said, yeah, okay, fine. So I gave it to her vision, <laughs> and we are so glad we did that because that place was massive. After a point, after three years, there was at one point there were six, seven of us living in that house. It was that huge for us to wow. allow that <clears throat> girl to come in. I mean, we did whoever was our friend, we allowed them to come in before they wanted to move out, kind of a thing. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, that was uh, that was great actually to have. Got that? So, it was like in a very pretty spot in Mandra, in reclamation, in like the heart of everything. So it was great. Like so, it opened up many things for me in a way that I think living with friends, uh, living on your own, managing your own money, and then even if I'm overspending, then I'm checking with my dad. Is it okay if I if I can invest in these curtains for the house? <laughs> He's like, yeah, it's okay. <laughs> you know. So, <laughs> things like that you manage you learn and then i didn't know jack shit about cooking so <laughs> my friend <laughs> laughed at me like i didn't even know how to boil potatoes and you then know, this I is what I, i feel that that everybody should be forced to be in like a pg of sorts at least for two years you know that just kind of sets them up for Absolutely. everything so during this time was there any reservation from the family in the early days because you know Arey, she's living alone. Arey, she doesn't know how to cook. Every day, she's calling and asking for recipes. And you know, we didn't have uh, video calls and WhatsApp and all that jazz at that point of time. So, how did you, how did you manage to hold them, hold the fort? I used to write a lot of letters. I think my letter okay. writing took me a lot, a long way. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of letters to every member in the family. Sometimes my grandmother, sometimes my mother. So they were happy that okay, she is keeping us informed and. 
uh, you know that's all i think they wanted and i think every uh, every year my negotiation tactics grew stronger and stronger that don't let me do one more film <laughs> let me <laughs> So yeah, it was just. I think it was just as simple as staying in touch. If you don't stay in touch, then it becomes worrisome for all of them. So then it was just like fair enough. Yeah, fair enough. So um, I know for a fact that this industry, the early days are quite a you know, it's it's quite a struggle, and um, I would believe that uh, the pay is um, you know very minimal for Bombay standards uh, in these early days. So looking back, how did you manage? I I know you had three roommates, but uh, two roommates. But then you know, how do you personally manage your uh, whole situation over there? So I always used only the public transport. <laughs> I always used only the bus. And there was a okay. fixed dabba. Then, and then <clears throat> when we're shooting, we earn more money. So shoots yeah, would always of yeah yeah. So the basic st- stipend yeah, I just covered our rent and covered my living costs. so that much it was taken care of and luckily because i was so close to raj sir and surut sir i think mm-hmm. i was I, i got a few uh, uh, ways of actually you uh, getting the best i mean i was getting the best within that little money that i was ha- having mm-hmm. so it was all mm-hmm. right for me and since um, though my other two girlfriends who went to cnbc the salary kept increasing our salary mm-hmm. didn't increase Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, they were in fact being given stock options and all that. So हमको तो वो सब कुछ था ही नहीं. We were like, okay, जो आ रहा है उसको save करो. We have to manage on this. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, yeah, so, but I was good at saving. I think I was good. <coughs> so here you are. You you settled in Bombay. You've jumped in the industry, lock, stock, barrel, and uh, you know this is seeming like something that you decide this is going to be the long haul. Now, did you jump in with an end goal or an end vision? Like you know, people say you should have a five-year, ten-year, five, seven, and a ten-year uh, plan in mind. Did you have anything of that sort going on? No, actually, for me, it was like okay, uh, Surat sir, who my assistant, he had said that you need to uh, be an assistant director of two films. Two films is enough. After that, you should start planning a feature. So then, mm-hmm. I when I finished my second film with Mr. Ghai, uh, which was Kisna, I took a one-year break. I went back to Chennai. to figure out what i want to do and in that much time i tried to write a script i also assisted uh, rajiv menon in chennai for a uh, 3 months and then mm-hmm. i i came back to bombay i joined mukta arts again i continued working on my script and i was talking to rajshri productions and they were so there was always this thing that this is a home company and i should be making a film for rajshri so at some point because uh, uh, they trust me and i think i like i want to work with them so it it was uh there was no no in like there was no year plan but the, it was always like if the script goes through then i should be able to make a film with rajshri because i was quite close to them so okay. uh it's just that the script didn't go through but surat sir felt that yeah she should direct because i have seen her how she narrates and she yeah. has that uh, thing that yeah she can direct so that okay. was one of the motivating factors to hear from your mentor and director that okay he does believe in me so, okay so when was the you already mentioned the first was, uh, you know you worked with uh, shubhash gai in the movie krishna but when was the first experience that you came across mukta arts i mean in your timeline was it just like suddenly a project came along and you went for it or did they so search finished, you out when I, yeah so i finished rajshri productions that film and then uh typically once you fin- finish a film you are supposed to move on and you are supposed to find uh, other projects Next so project, i was not yeah. too sure yeah so i was and rajshri that time had no film going on floor so the idea was then you have to get out <coughs> my sister megna was working in mukta arts limited at that time as a writer the, in the writing mm-hmm. group so uh, she uh, she said that uh, you know mr guy is setting up a team why don't you come and meet the associate director jaydeep sir so mm-hmm. i went and met him jaydeep was uh, Uh, was like of course we will get you to meet mr ghai mm-hmm. it was just like okay i got to know that this project is looking for assistant directors and then i ended up going there and then of course then the place okay so that's how you get get in mukta so yeah <clears throat> okay so really quickly um viewers who are watching if you have any questions for arti do drop in a comment and i'll be able to pull you on on the screen with us that way you can interact with her live 
So if you want to do that, drop in a comment on uh, any of the social medias where we are, and I'll be able to pull you back in over here. So Arti, today um, you have a fairly close working relationship with Mr. Ghai and Mukta Arts, and this relationship obviously has been built over a number of years of working on various projects under various scope of uh, job roles. Okay, um, what kind of responsibilities are you trusted with now when you work with Mr. Ghai's products or with Mukta Arts? So till before lockdown, like nearly uh, uh, last two years, two three years, we were. We did a lot of stuff for Whistling Woods International, where we created an entire uh, archive of educational master classes with Mr. Ghai on all his films. Like we shot, mm -hmm. like each film has been uh, analyzed. So he has a whole roster of some 16 super hits, uh, yep. 16 classic films out of the 1920 that he's directed. So um, we have analyzed why those films worked or why, uh, how they ended up working, what was the special point, and if the films failed, why did they fail? So things like that, that's the whole <clears throat> part series that I'd, we actually reconnected on in, back in 2017. And then mm -hmm. along with, he was, he's been developing quite a few stories and concepts for the past three, four years. So he, uh, I joined the writing room, like I was started developing stuff for him in the past one year. But now in the COVID situation, everything's been put at the back burner. So yeah, so since, actually since uh, March, that we haven't done any development work for Mukhtar's, but yeah. But a lot of okay. stuff was developed in the last one and a half years with him, me personally, and he himself with his team has been developing stuff for the past five years, so. All right, fantastic. So that's a interesting. Of, uh, a lot of their own, uh, uh, yeah, a lot of web series, a lot of whatever the market needs right now. Okay. So um, the movie industry is mostly work for hire. Okay. That is something which um, I think um, is very evident once you get in the industry, you realize that. And um, so in the industry, what do you think? So what would you say the yardstick is? Is the yardstick is that you're as good as your last mistake or you're as good as your last success? No, industry is that you're good as your last Friday, actually. <laughs> <laughs> That's the saying in the industry. So what, was, uh, what, what, what does been... that mean? You're good as your last Friday. Friday, Friday is the release that happens, right? In film. Ah. So as good as your last Friday. Okay. Yeah. So your last that's, release. That's the last release. So it's a success or a fail. It's. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that is so messed up. Yeah. That is so messed up because the movie could fail clearly because of somebody else's mistake, and yeah. you could have done like the best, uh, you know, job. But oh yeah. well. It is what it is. But I've not been so much in mainstream, you know, Rahul. In the last five six years, <clears throat> I've been doing a lot of offbeat stuff. The last feature film that I was actually a part was of Bombaria. And mm -hmm. uh, after Bombaria, it's been documentary. I mean, even before Bombaria, since actually 2011-12, I've actually taken a slightly alternate course. Uh, Bombaria happened in the middle. I was doing, uh, but I did a lot of short films. I did uh, a lot of, uh, uh, I did one, I did a working stint with the Japanese film industry, a, a largest uh, at, at film production house called Aoi Pro. So, okay. uh, yeah, so it's been a slightly varied curve for me in the last, but my first 10 years were so well grounded that yeah, I understand how the industry works, but I've not done anything concretely in feature film business in the last few years. Mumbai was the last action. Okay. So um, now what I realized while going through your IMDB profile, you, you have an IMDB profile, you know that, right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so you'd be like, oh, really? <laughs> so yeah, in the last 18 years. You're taken seriously only if you have an IMDb profile. Sadly, that is the case. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Fantastic. So uh, kids who are out there who want to make it in the movie industry, you know, Facebook is out of the question. LinkedIn is out of the question. Your Instagram I following am. is out of the question. What really matters is IMDb. So as if social media was not enough, here's one more thing you need to worry about, okay? <laughs> and this is coming from experience. I'm not saying this. Somebody who's been in the industry for nearly 20 years is saying this. So um, you have 18 plus years uh, experience in the industry. And um, 
from 2007 as the listing is you were listed as a miscellaneous crew then you became a writer around 2011 ish um, you even acted in a movie in 2012 and then from there you moved on to a second unit ad and then finally becoming a director of um, you know a couple of super hit movies in the last uh, towards the uh, last bit of your career this has really been a long time coming you know uh, all these various jobs, you know, was it just to get experience of these different facets before you drop the anchor and say, okay, this is what works for me? Or was it that you were just trying to stay relevant with the end goal in sight? Uh, so, yeah, so I, the idea was to get a bird's eye view of everything. And uh, okay. because as a director, you need to be uh, you're accountable to lots of departments. You know, handling like everybody is looking at you to tell them what to do. So if you don't know what that department is working, how is that department working? It becomes, um, you you won't be able to tell them, you won't be able to lead them. So the idea was to actually uh, do two films purely as an assistant director. And after that, get a bird's eye view in production in all aspects, be it in one film I was doing handling actors' dates, handling actors. In another film I was handling costumes. In another film I was handling uh, just basic production. So in one another film, I was doing post. So you know things like that. When you get that kind of a perspective, then it becomes uh, much more easier for you to set out when you do a feature film that you need to have. Uh, at least I feel that you 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 at least understand what is happening around you. Of course, each project has its own has its own challenges, but mm-hmm. uh, uh, but you at least know what you're doing. And um, uh, yeah, so. It, the writer in 2011 was a fluke thing, something called Jana Pachana. It, it was not like I was not supposed to write. It was not. It's not my film. It's just that I gave a basic story idea uh, to Rajshri, to Raj sir, and he felt that no, it was such a uh, because he was struggling. He was not cracking the idea. So I said, sir, what if you do this? So then he was like, Are, so he gave me a writer credit. I said, but I've not done anything on this. <laughs> So sometimes these credits, you know, are random. It, it happens many a times in the industry that you have written, but you don't take the credit you give it to someone else. You have not written, but you get the credit. Like it's just as random. <laughs> so, well, that, yeah. that definitely yeah, makes yeah. me a little uncomfortable knowing that you yeah, could have worked yeah, for something but not gotten credit. That's messed up. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, I, I told him something. No, you don't understand. Your idea has actually nailed everything. So that was very random. He gave me the credit. He gave me the credit. After that, of course, the short films that I made, I did with, it's all mine. I know these are my babies. Like Time, which is at 30 million views. And, you know, things like that. Those, Mm -hmm. that I put my entire heart and soul. So, yeah. So you said when you were, you when you were giving the answer to this question, when I asked, you know, was it like, you know, dipping your feet in every facet, trying to be relevant in, in the industry? You said, you started off saying that as a director. So that means the director was always your end goal, is it? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So that you always knew idea. that. Okay. Uh, that I want to direct, but then at some point in 2000, you know, uh, very uh, candid uh, feeling I'm sharing is that between 2013 and 16, maybe I felt that I need to relook. Maybe I don't need to be a director. Maybe I can just be a writer. Maybe I can be a producer. You know, you think that maybe. They're not cut out to be a director. Things like that also happen. Yeah, but yeah. then, you know, then then you end up, then suddenly you make a khamakha, which happens where everything is falling magically in place. Yeah. And it becomes, it turns out to be so good that it goes to goes on to win a film fair. Mm-hmm. Uh, because everything fell in place. Then again, sometimes you wonder, it's like, okay, is it just like a one film wonder? <laughs> and then, you know, yeah. so you just carry on. So then after you being just, emotional- you love doing what you do so and now i'm not i'm very open i'm very receptive to okay in this project i would like to just contribute as a writer in this project i would like to be a a good pushing force i will work as a producer like you know where i'll make things happen so i'm uh, this project i really want to direct because this is like close to the heart so things like that so you did answer one of my questions which was going to be like, you know, was there any phase where you felt like you were in the wrong, you're wearing the wrong shoe and, and you did say that, you know, that that kind of goes through and um, it definitely does go through a lot with the creative genre because yeah, yeah, yeah. it's just how uh, the monster is. 
and um, you know after being immersed in the indian indian in, uh, movie industry for a decade and a half you get to work in the japanese industry okay now i'm purely asking this because i have immense respect for the japanese culture so share your experience simply on the work culture between the two industries so yeah it was just fantastic like i was so happy i did it and i regret not going moving to japan earlier like i could have easily moved immediately after i got married 2010 i just got gone there for 3 months came back no no i have projects here i have to finish stuff here but all mm-hmm. everything got let go here then i finally had to move to japan because it was like high time husband is living there i can't just be keeping this long distance thing mm-hmm. so i moved and it turned out to be so wonderful because first four months i was doing my own independent stuff only i was trying to make short films in japan also and then i ended landed up this ja- uh, job in uh, aoi pro uh, which uh, w- was the largest and the most international film production house over there and they had mm-hmm. offices all over asia so there here was this indian girl walking in and i had this american boss julie thomas who was just like marvelous like i really love her so much so she uh, took me in under her wing and she uh, i immediately got a job there within like 3 4 weeks because they felt okay there's here's an indian girl in tokyo maybe she can do research for us to open an office in india so mm-hmm. and then it so happened that I, had, i started doing up and down mumbai tokyo and uh, i was doing a lot of research for them and I was doing something completely different from what I was doing before. So this was more like consolidation, going interviewing uh, CCOs, CEOs, putting stuff together, making the Japanese company understand how they could be of value here in India. So it was. Uh, I was glad I took that break off from films. Like I wanted to detach, so I did that, and uh, uh, the detachment helped. And I was also learning Japanese as a language. So I feel you know those three four years really. Sh- change the way i started seeing things it was only i was not this frog in the well i saw suddenly i'm out and you know like i <laughs> like i'm like it suddenly the world has opened up in a brand new way to me and i'm seeing content in a different way my husband is fully into world cinema so he was showing me content in a different way so i was uh, yeah and that all that actually helped me evolve into something uh, more receptive and open to Uh, different kinds of content and not be stuck on mainstream content no but that still doesn't answer my question about the different culture of the the work the working style the ah, working so culture like, of the indian the industry as opposed to the japanese yeah, work culture there are many things like you know uh uh like they, they have this thing called time the roots before a meeting so we okay. all have to yeah so we all have to agree like we, if we are three people who are working on a presentation together i have two seniors above me we all have to agree on one presentation before going to the senior we couldn't be doing our own thing in front of the senior we had to stick to script so that right. kind of methodicalness that was there they had they had a term for it it's called tying the roots so i okay. think that was something very new to me and then secondly they so particular about time about discipline about being proper <laughs> about but for me because i'm so this i keep cracking this uh, this uh, insight to a lot of people and uh, who know me that i was close to raj sir that for me it was dealing the dealing with the japanese was dealing with thousand raj sirs you know so raj sir <laughs> was just as particular it was like i was i was prepped to train under raj sir to be dealing with these the japanese <laughs> <laughs> just so it was like very expected okay this is what ratha always wanted this particular and this methodical so i just stick to that <laughs> so, <laughs> so like you know being on time not using your phone when you're traveling on the train you know yeah, yeah. seeing your boss and you know they, they always follow this hierarchy without being told what to do and i don't know it's just that this is mad people is what i call them Though it is yeah. one of the countries that I definitely want to live for a very long time in, but it is what it is. So there was this so, one thing, you know, like five, you <clears throat> appear five minutes before your meeting. You do not end up uh, before that. You have to reach sharp, sharp at twelve. Delay to chore jo. You even if you reach earlier, you cannot just go. I'm early. No, you must come for the other person. That person is not prepared to receive you five minutes. Before. <laughs> so you better wait out in the building. And reach exactly at twelve. <laughs> so, yeah, Crazy. Like 
So on a serious note, you achieved the highest award that the Indian film industry has to offer. Okay, uh, a film fair for the best director for your independent in 2017 called Kamakha. It has really been a long journey, you know, 18 plus, uh, 15 plus years getting to this point. Okay, you got the film fair, you did the award, you did the whole, you know, glitz and the glamour. How well did you sleep that night? Oh, I <laughs> actually. the award was announced uh, a week before the actual ceremony so the mm-hmm. day the award was going to be announced because that was done digitally on facebook i think all, the entire team my entire producing team hamara movie everybody was glued to the screen that uh, you know who, which because they had other films also they had three other films i think competed so uh, and then when kabir khan announced uh, and the winner is rts bagdi everybody just shut up the scream and everybody started calling each other <laughs> no they did not wait for like kamal khan to come <laughs> just that my first reaction was okay let me call mom and of course i called mom she was of course so emotional i think all this is a high for the family more than the person you know yeah. family and friends who rooted for you i think it's actually a big high for them so the, you you went for the the award ceremony you know where we you where we saw photos of you with the with the black lady officially in your hand you know a week later so that's what i'm asking about you come back home and then like finally it's in your hand you know that whole week was probably the longest wait i would guess but finally getting it in your hand and then do you do you sleep well or do you just like like so, so I, much I, energy I at 5 in the morning after the ceremony because we got the award at around 2 in the night Yeah. So it, naturally, I had to. I was very sleepy, but for the night, so <laughs> that's a, that's a given for me. I cannot stay up beyond twelve. So uh, yeah. So then, anyway, so went to, got the award, took the photos in that sleepy state, came back home, and was home by five thirty six. My husband was waiting. My music director Amit had come down, so he was also waiting. So we were just like you know, we did this thing there where you put the Lady in next to the TV. I'm yeah. just watching it like the movie's on. <laughs> yeah, she's just gonna say something. <laughs> <laughs> like it was just like uh, I think it was too overwhelming an experience to like see a black lady in your house. <laughs> All right, and and the next morning, like you know, was it just another day, or does the coffee taste sweeter? No, no, no. So a lot of calls, a lot of photos being shared. That the lady I send us the lady's photo. How <laughs> heavy is it? How light is it? <laughs> oh yeah, how how heavy is it? It's quite heavy. So for the next six months after the lady, I had to take it around to. Uh, so we had three parties just for the lady to be seen. In the <laughs> And everybody is like, "How heavy is this?" <laughs> Crazy. So now Kamaka is. Uh, it was a shoestring uh, production. Is is what the information that I'm aware to. Okay, but it turned out to be a grand success. and um this was by a very small crew that you had put the movie together kamaka now when you um got down to shooting it i think it was done over a period of 3 days or something if i'm not mistaken two the whole yeah, two, days. two days so okay so it was two day shoot so when you put it together at the end of it you know what was your gut gut instinct did you feel like theek hai you know projects over or did you feel that yes it was well executed I think after I finished the film, <clears throat> when, while we were shooting, I knew there was something good happening. But after I finished the film, I was not too sure how it'll cut together, because uh, you know, uh, performance-wise, Harsh was a very subtle, like had a very, and we were in a bus, so I was not able to judge the sound quality in terms of Harsh was a very subtle performer, and Manjiri was equally that bright. So that was mm-hmm. anyway their characters also. So I was very nervous about how the performances will actually find that chemistry together. But uh, luckily, on the edit, it worked, and of course, on the dub, we took care of a few elements that we were the actors and me were like, let's improve this. So yeah, uh, but we never expected the film. Like we knew it, something good is being made, but we never expected it to like. Fair enough. And on the heels of the success of Urne Do, you push out. Uh, sorry, on the uh, heels of success of Kamaka, you push out. You know, Urne Do, which is another shot which has won nine international awards. 
and um, you know it's it's been a raving success i remember seeing the social media posts and every other day some new screening some new mention and it was just phenomenal now as a director again when you're making orne do did you get a sense that you were actually sitting on like a solid topic because it is a very sensitive topic for the yeah <clears throat> yeah that i was aware first of all when i was approached by the foundation to make the film for their school i think i was just i was immediately amazed that something like this is happening at that grassroots level in municipal schools in schools in pune that someone is educating kids about good touch and bad touch so for me yeah. that itself was eye opening so you know i was uh, i was like okay that's very interesting and they want a feature film which is actually talking about this cause so i knew as a subject that there's great appeal in it and mm-hmm. uh, child sexual abuse i think on social media also uh, has been quite talked about people are now openly coming out and talking about it. Right. so that is uh, uh, i knew it could it had the power to be a talking point and of course it became even more powerful when revathi stepped in and decided right. to be a part of the film because she also yeah. felt for the cause so we all did this is a honorable project like it was meant mm-hmm. for schools it was meant for a foundation So of course uh, the producer Mrs Usha Kakade was kind enough to like let me send it to festivals where it matters mm-hmm. especially children's film festivals where mm-hmm. it should reach that kind of an audience and mm-hmm. uh, it ended up doing uh, I was quite surprised when it won in Japan and as a grand prix like the largest children's film festival I think I think for I think the fact that it won in Japan was a big uh, like thing for you <laughs> for me yeah yeah and then of course when it won in turkey so that month was really special that it won in japan and in turkey and okay. uh, yeah but you know but there are things in urne do like you know whenever you look at stuff there are there are things that you feel you could have done better so urne do is one project where i feel i could have done a bit better in terms of uh, execution and few things that i feel i could have achieved in a different way different way okay So how was it working with such an experience and a senior actress like Revathi Ma'am? Because I remember her from uh, from the movie Anjali very fondly because uh, oh, that's a movie I, that's like uh, very well etched in my brain. So how was it working with her? Because you know she's also a director. So was there difference of opinion on the set, or was she just like, okay, I'm just going to be an actress? She is totally gracious. Like she is like another level of. a uh, subtlety humility and even if she has a point to put across na she'll put it across so beautifully that you're like uh, yes yeah, yeah i think this is a great point to accept you know so things like uh, so she even contributed at a couple of very crucial points in the script level which made it so mm-hmm. powerful then um, so when you have that kind of an uh, you, you then you know why these people why a uh, actor like revathi is where she is is the way she conducts herself she knows mm-hmm. there's no budget still she's being so like uh, beautifully uh, gracious in the way she she in one day we shot her entire portion one day i really stretched her and for her to speak in a language which is not hers that entire hindi speech that she had to give mm-hmm. so it was uh, it was tough but she really did it so you've got the film fair for kamaka yeah kamaka so you got the film fair for kamaka and then urne do bags in about nine international awards okay and then on the heels of that you give the third wicket which is you know free fair and fearless a short which uh, bags you the award from the national institute of rural development of india from the government of india so how did you come up with this idea of uh, free uh, for uh, free fair and fear, fearless so this was actually <clears throat> something that came to me uh, in terms of the script came to me the project came to me it was uh, the idea was uh, initiated by uh, the sp of b district of maharashtra just before the maharashtra state elections so okay. he wanted a film which created awareness that the police force is with you when you want to go and vote for whomever you want to go and vote for. so it was uh, uh, it was to create that awareness of being free fair and fearless so it okay. was as, it was a very quick project and again i decided to do this because it was i felt as a good cause here so i jumped in on a bus drove down to this village we were four of us it was all overnight again in a matter of 10 days we finished the project and gave it to them so 
was done that quickly with the actors from the village mm -hmm. everything okay. from the village so well you know is it fair for me to assume that your upbringing influences your style of telling stories to some level yes okay to some level. but now for instance that i'm doing i'm trying to do stuff which is which which gets me out of my comfort zone so for instance this uh, film that i've just made in lockdown parda it's based on an extra marital affair so mm -hmm. uh, it's something that uh, typically i would Oh, say seven, ten years back, I wouldn't choose such a subject, but now I'm choosing. Like you know, I want to tell stories which are more human, where there are more grey characters. So. Okay. So has Arti Bagri finally dropped anchor as successful short film director, or is that um, dream of one feature film still there? Of course, a feature, the feature, feature. Everyone will dream. I mean, I want to dream. We have written so many features on scripts in the last few years. One of them has to see the light of the day. <laughs> okay. Well, we keep our fingers crossed. Why one? You know, as many as see the way day, that's going to be. Yes, good. I, yes, I agree. But one should be the starting point. Let's not get too ahead of ourselves. Well, yeah, it always starts with the first, right? Yeah. Like you said. You but okay, I'm enjoying this short film process also, actually, because uh, okay. it's very liberating. You know, yeah, there's no. Commercial compilations. You're actually doing purely love for storytelling and love for the craft and love for performances. You know, and love for actually putting a film together. There's no like, ki abhi gana chahiye, abhi comedy scene chahiye, nahi. Wo sab kuch nahi hai. Tum bana rahe ho, tum bana. You know, but love does not always pay the bills. Yeah, that's true. So yeah, so you end up doing gigs. You end up doing gigs. So I did this gig with Amazon Prime. I did these 19 promotional short films. So you do do take up projects which actually pay your bills also. So, okay. like for instance, the documentary on the Jain um, monk on Vidyodaya, well, that was a paid gig. Um, okay. Things like that, yeah. Right. Mumbai was a paid gig. So. All right. So moving away from what you have achieved and done so far, let's get a little more into a different state. So you've done this whole trek to the Everest base camp. Other than figuring out that you were perfectly fit to do something like this, what was your real takeaway from the trip? Wow, you brought up Everest base camp. <laughs> I didn't see that coming. <laughs> Why well, you're not yeah. going to see a lot of questions coming in this show? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, it was. Uh, lifetime kind of a memory and uh, something that i'll never forget and it was i think the prepping for it was equally uh, a crucial uh, time for me like because i've never been like such a fitness freak kind of a person i've been a very yoga and do my you know flow go in the flow kind of a person so this was actually you know, actually strengthening yourself to take that trek so yeah it was great uh, it was I mean, it is what all mountains. I mean, it's. I think going to the mountains is the perfect balm for any person in the creative field. I think so, and walking and just walking and walking and walking through time and just being in that moment and being in that step and not caring about anything else. Your phone is disconnected and you know, think like that. So it's just a great space to be in. So, and the group of people that they that were. In that Everest base camp, it was great to do with that entire group. Like I think we were really uh, me, my sister Shalini. We went out uh -huh. together. So it was, and another cousin Shelly. So it was great to meet a whole new bunch of lovely people. <laughs> so tell me something. When was the last time you were violent? Violent? Oh God. I'm always violent with my husband. <laughs> so should I should I even ask? Should I even ask that was the violence justified and were you correct or not? <laughs> no, no, I'm joking. But I don't know. They were violent. I'm trying to remember. I mean, you mean abusive violence, like verbal violence, or? Uh, physical yeah, violence. Whatever your whatever your term for violence, what you know, whatever your <laughs> explanation for violence is. Like, if you ask me, when was I violent the last time? Like, maybe 
10 minutes before the show started there is mosquito that was getting on my nerves and it was absolutely justified because dengue is on the rise in the city so definitely no discussion over there so uh, interestingly the documentary that i did which is with you there which the core thing was non violence to practice non violence is the biggest virtue that one <laughs> you can have and i seriously lack that i guess <laughs> all right so we have this one question coming in from kunal he says rt you come across as a real life storyteller something that you pick from your day to day real life event stories that's true so is, okay thank you i'm glad you observed that and yeah i like i'm the rishikesh mukherjee basu chatterjee kind of a <laughs> <laughs> okay then and then he says have you ever thought about making a movie on your abc trip uh making a movie yes on some hike not necessarily abc trip but yeah okay. some hike for sure yeah. i have a couple of stories going on in my head yeah. abc trip okay. will be very difficult to actually achieve to go shoot there oh well right here he is backing you up he says creative people are stressed mostly but rarely violent how would kunal know how would kunal know fine that <laughs> <laughs> well so he does have a streak of creativity in him but um, we we'll leave it at that yeah okay so the great pandemic of 2020 has taken over all our lives and uh, everyone's doing something or the other mostly what i see people around me are attending a lot of classes or giving a lot of gyan okay correct so it's either you're teaching or you're attending and i've seen some who are doing both okay Correct. but amidst all this you find this whole 100 day sketch project where you challenge yourself to make one sketch every day for 100 days how did right. you land up in this uh, challenge so uh, the thing is around 2 3 years back i saw this uh, friend of mine who was also my colleague at archery kavya she did she did a 100 day watercolor project and she was posting oh, not wow. every day yeah she did uh, mm-hmm. randomly i think she was doing in weekends and all and i was amazed that she she actually came up with this idea or wherever it must have been floating online also and yeah. she was doing it so regularly and of course she is amazing so uh, uh i was uh, i was like shit i want to do something like this at some point in my life and when the lockdown began i'd always been attracted to art as a child but i had never pursued it you know because typically i just went off into science and all that nonsense i did in my life So <laughs> so I just felt you know, now is the time that I should uh, possibly see if I have some the art element that I think I have uh, and I'm attracted to and then I decided to explore so every day I would pick up one piece that I like and I would do and it just slowly gradually as anything that you practice starts getting better started getting better so uh, and then I some point someone wanted to start buying like the first purchase was done by my sister's some brother in law my cousin my yeah she he wanted to buy for his wife i said are you why do you want to buy just take it no 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 i will buy <laughs> is it okay to buy to first to happen then my friend from smc the first friend from my college like batchmate like not friends friends as such so manisha she insisted on buying one girl library girl I said, "Are you okay? Fine. You want to pay? I mean, why should I say no? <laughs> like, and then, dear, dear, like nine, ten, eleven, twelve, big guy, and then now, be. I said, okay, let me start pushing now. And then, dear, dear, I started pushing after uh, after I touched eighty, eighty five. I started pushing a Pinterest link around that if you okay. want to, you can to buy. Please look at this. And then it touched thirty five. Now it's actually nearing forty with a few orders that have come in." So and then what was the auction was it surprising to be in an auction like you know out of the blue you're just doing sketching for a challenge and you get into an auction how does that go No it felt nice that people want to own it people actually want to yeah. pay for it that it felt yeah. really really nice that I mean it gave me confidence at some point I'm like uh but you know one third of it has been bought by my batchmates and I'm like okay I mean they're being kind they're being sweet and then sometimes you buy and people are buying <laughs> because they want to buy So then you feel yeah. okay, my piece really good. So you keep doubting, you know that is it that good that people are buying? <laughs> All right. So you've plowed through this testing time and through a tough movie industry, you know that is often soaked and covered in this whole 
uh, really thick layer of glitz and glamour. That is what the perception is outside. Um, many people that I know of who joined the industry um, right after we finished off college, you know, uh, I had some friends who made a beeline for the industry. They have given up and they have moved on to doing something or the other. And uh, there are some who still keep going like yourself. So what is it that drives you to do this? I think for the love of storytelling. I think the love of storytelling, love of, uh, you know, getting a team together, a lot of different creative energies coming together and, you know, believing in one vision and mm -hmm. making something mm -hmm. together. I think all that works. Of course, it's just not love of storytelling. So then I could be writing a book also. I, took a, I could take her on a solo project also. But I love working with actors. Uh, I love working with, uh, uh, you know, with my DOP. I love working with music. I love working with all elements of creativity that come make like it's such a amalgam uh, film is such an amalgamation of all creative forms and it is like i feel the highest satisfaction you can get out of uh, for your own creativity at whatever level you have and then you keep i think apart apart from that i think films is a very for me films is a very spiritual medium i feel you have the power to become a better person through and through it through it all because you're actually going through so many life stories in every project you're going through so many character arcs you're being like god to so many little nuances in every script of yours that you know mm -hmm. somewhere along you want to be that better person in your life also you know because kind of so i think you slowly steadily become a better person also through this process i think that's also one of the reasons i fell in love with filmmaking Okay. So it's mostly the drive is mostly the love for the art form art, that you have. The craft, and the, art, yeah, yeah. the craft and the art. Okay. Here's one more interesting question for you. You ever thought about making a movie on human trafficking because it's a huge concern in India? I ask this because I feel a filmmaker like you can do justice to such a sensitive subject. Yeah, human trafficking being women and children, only children, men, like what, what kind of human trafficking is he talking about? Well, I think it's a gender. Very, he, yeah, I think it would be very general. I'm pretty sure he didn't expect that he'll come back with more <laughs> specific questions. Yeah, but like, uh, yeah, uh, it would be uh, a, quite a great tale to tell. In oh, he says of, both. Okay. <clears throat> I haven't, I haven't worked on any subject yet. Mm-hmm. I would like to, I think. I mean, I haven't thought of... You haven't put thought into it. Yeah, I haven't. Mm. Okay, especially girl children. Mm. I haven't thought of it. But it'll be nice to do something. Nice as in being... Interesting to look into it, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, other than... Now, uh, that film, Lion. Lion. Sorry, say again? No? It was that film, no? Uh, that a little kid who's uh, with Nicole Kidman and uh, he's transported to australia this indian kid who goes to australia very very beautiful again on trafficking on no it was more on first trafficking and then it becomes adoption yeah okay but no i haven't worked on any such subject yeah okay so other than making a comfortable living what's your incentive to continue in this industry is it uh, i mean you already said the art form but then you know you still like i said art doesn't pay the bills <laughs> so no, I do hope to make a film that will uh, end up earning 300 crores. Nice. So you have a number in the mind. <laughs> I spent 15 crores on it and it ends up earning 300 crores. Yeah. So you have essentially seen the evolution of the industry. I'm pretty sure when you started, they were using film and now it's become to, you know, OTT subscription based with, um, you know, say a company like Netflix, which has a production house, which is unheard of, you know, or even people making independent movies or stuff like that. You know, you've, you've seen the, the shift in the industry. Uh, do you think it's uh, much more easier to get in the industry for newcomers now than before, or uh, you feel it's more competitive now? It is easier and it is competitive both because you have to be uh, uh, the easier part is that because there's so many OTTs, that means there are that, that much more content out there, that much more need for content out there. <clears throat> you need to go out and make and not everybody is driving towards OTT. Like 
some people still review the theaters like the traditional film families still review the theaters but ott is the next now in the last few months the way films have been releasing uh, such a backlog of films that were supposed to come out in theaters are now coming out in otts and i can't imagine mm. the films, quite a few of the films that have released i can't imagine they would have done well in the theaters so i'm glad okay. they've come out directly on the ott like the <laughs> So, like, I was just discussing this with Arun in the morning. That we just like, I mean, that whole box office parameter is gone now. At least this time, whenever the theater comes up, it comes up. But it's now you're just like, okay, you word of mouth. If you've liked it, you've talked about it to your friend, and then you ins- and then the friend ends up ends up watching it, or you read a review and you end up watching it. But actually, to pay and go is what it is. But we knew when it's not there now. So before we started, you were worried if you'd have anything more to say than thirty minutes. We're just about closing one hour sixteen minutes. Oh, so good! Rahul, you do tell stories. Interesting person, what to say, man? It's so easy to talk to you. <laughs> so you do know how to spin stories. Well, in closing, would you have anything to say to students who are now sitting on the fence with uh, should we go for the creative fields or not? because you've been through it all yeah so i think you should go if you have the love for it and you you should be prepared that it can be a long arduous journey like mine but uh, 18 years but, 18 years that's yeah, about but, pretty much the entire lifetime you've lived to reach to your board exams yeah exactly so if you have that i mean you should have patience so that one of the few things again that i learned from surat sir as the day one that i joined him that uh, patience is going to get you everywhere in this industry then the uh, even when i joined uh, uh, subhash gai the first day he said three things you need in this industry is patience patience and patience so you mm-hmm. have to sometimes you have to wait it out sometimes you don't have to wait it out it suddenly happen so perfect thank you so much arti this has been wonderful talking to you and thank you for taking time out and sharing your story with us and it's um i i think uh, we got a lot of uh, points to think about lot of thoughts to think about so penny for your thoughts i wish i could hand over some pennies to you but uh, okay. thank you so much it's been fun thank you so much rahul i really one hour and 15 minutes god <laughs> really over 18 <laughs> yeah 18 thank you so much it was such a privilege doing this with you and uh, you've been a dear friend and thank you for everything and thanking you you for letting me share so much no no you're welcome and the next week we're going to have a wonderful um uh, i don't know if i should say this no, no. we got let's just we're going to have a wonderful alifia calcutta wala who's who's got about i think 5 or 6 degrees before she's got in doing what she does and she does this insane um travel company where you know when you're sick and tired of uh, what she says the regular um trips and when you're looking for something beyond that that's when people come to me so that's going to be exciting and uh, she's got 6 degrees or 5 degrees some weird stuff like that so that's like even crazier so wow. <laughs> it's nuts so nice. we'll talk soon thank you so much arti it's been great and uh, i'll be in touch and thanks so much for doing this thank you all right bye bye